Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome along to 90 Min. Hope you're all doing fantastically well on today's show. Scott Saunders, Harry Simeon, myself, Jacob Colshaw, and Sam Tai, journalist and broadcaster. We had a bit of a mix-up just before we went live because I was about to pronounce his name wrong, which would be really, really unprofessional. Uh, do, you, do you get that often? Yes, yeah. constantly. All my life. So I'm just one of the <laughs> from common. The, from the beginnings of the school register and the first, first day of the new year all the way through to one minute ago <laughs> with, with our esteemed host here who does all of his prep. Yeah, I, I, I think Jakey, like, I, I, th I think you should have asked. I, I feel like you I just... Did ask. He did no, ask. No, 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 you, didn't. You, you came you out said with it. it. <laughs> you said it knowing that he'd correct you if it was wrong. It's a great point. It's different. Yeah, yeah. We're, still, we're, we're still, straight to VAR. Still not the worst on the radio once I got asked and they still did it wrong anyway. I, I get that really? all so, the time. Yeah. Every, every radio show, anything yeah. is... How do you pronounce it? You tell them and they still get it well, wrong. Well, they like say saltemu. Uh, yeah, <laughs> salt uh, Yeah, I, I've had all sorts, man. I Sam, how are you, sir? I'm really well, thank you. Lovely really to well. have you on. Uh, Welcome. Full, yeah, full 90 min debut. Mm -hmm. um, should be, it is, right? It should is, be good one, it yeah. is, yeah. Okay. Because we always have that weird phase, don't we, Scott, where we're like, we've had some people on before and they're like, is it their debut? Is it their second Because they might work with like other teams <laughs> yes. as well, which is a little bit weird. Um, but hey, yeah. A okay. lot to get through in today's show. Stick with us. Um, we're going to start with the Champions League from last night. 18 goals in these last four Champions League course finals. My question to you, Harry, is is removing away goals from the Champions League the best thing that could have happened to the competition? Yeah, it's a positive for me. I know a lot of people disagree, but the reason it's a positive for me is because we've seen, for example, uh, Manchester City go to Real Madrid and score three goals. We've seen Bayern come to the Emirates and score a couple of goals. We saw Barcelona go and get three at PSG last night. And none of those ties are over as a result of it. Yeah. They're still equally balanced. They're finely poised. I like it. I think as well, what happens is, is that when you're the home team, if you've conceded one away goal and you know you, you want to throw players forward to try and get an equaliser and you'll always be reluctant of the, the spaces you leave and the risks you run with regards to maybe conceding another and, and the damage that can do. So I like it. Um, I was a bit apprehensive when the idea was floated around because I'm very much like, don't mess around with things that are good. Uh, but you know they've done it and it, and it's worked. Scott, where do we stand on away goals? I was very against it previously at the time. At the time, okay. And I think it's only right, that really, this week that's changed my mind. I think you I think you're really? onto something. The yeah. last two nights have changed your whole well, perspective just, on away goals. Teams have come out and just been able to express themselves, and we've seen a lot of goals. And obviously, the away goals thing is essentially a killer. Like even if a team would win their home leg two one, that that one goal that the away team scored was so powerful. And then you had the the difficulty within the second leg. The away team in the second leg had 30 more minutes to score an away goal. So that was a bit of an unfair advantage as well. But I'll tell you what, if we get more games like this, you know, more goals like this. Have you been swayed fantastic. over the last couple of nights, Sam? I think I've, I've, I've always been team, this is a good idea, okay. to be honest with you. Um, and yeah, this week has been great proof in the pudding. I do accept that over the last year and a half, we have seen some, some drab first legs. And I think that's where the... the distinction needs to be made this this can have an effect on the first leg of games in a way that it did not before but it usually keeps it intact for the second leg so the second time these two teams play each other it's almost <coughs> always in the balance whereas before I think there were far more examples of ties being done after 90 which is no longer the case almost nothing is finished after 90 minutes now because you really can't pull out of sight unless you did what Man City did against Copenhagen but that wasn't just down to away goals was it that was the fact that we're talking about Man City and Copenhagen. Mm. So it just keeps things in the balance over the course of 180 minutes. And I think it, it keeps ties alive for the second leg much more frequently, which is really important. To flip the argument though, Harry, some people are saying, actually, we've not really learned anything going to the second leg because we're still at the same point at the start, 2-2, two, 3-3 two, three, three in, in, the, in the games on Tuesday night. Has it actually impacted it as much as we would have liked? Because I think there's a, there is an argument to say, for example, uh, the Porto-Arsenal uh, leg, I think Porto might have set up slightly differently if away goals were a bigger factor and it was in play, if that makes sense. They might have set up a different tactically and I felt there was probably more styles when the away goals came in, whereas it felt a little bit more gung-ho from both teams um, no, when I, the away goals came I goal. think you want it to be gung-ho. As someone who's a neutral watching on, if you don't have any skin in the game, you want two teams to go at it. But as a fan oh, of, of a team in the Champions League? I, I'm fine with it. Okay. I'm fine with it because, like, for example... You know, this idea of like you conceding a couple of goals at home is going to bury you in a tie. I just don't like that. I want there to be jeopardy going into the second games. 
Um, what's what's happened is that it's taken people a bit of time to adjust. So if you're a coach that's been coaching in the Champions League for 10 years and you've always had a certain mindset with regards to how you approach a two-legged tie, you have to adjust that, you have to change that, but that's what the best managers do. Yep. They adjust, they adapt, and they change their ways. I'm all for it. I wasn't at the beginning. It's a bit like the new Champions League format. At the moment, I'm saying, uh, I'm not sure about it. Panned, but ch yeah. change is really but, scary. Yeah. Because we, we, yeah, just don't don't like we just don't like it. But then you kind of get into it and you're like, all right, okay, that makes more yeah. sense. Now, I'm also, I've got some trepidation about the new format. But you know what? Ask me in 18 months, I'll probably love it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But no, that, that's, that feels really weird in the same way that removing away goals was weird. I think sometimes it's good to look back at why rules were introduced in the first place in order to ascertain why they might be removed. And the away goals was put in donkeys years ago to stop away teams rocking up at, 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 at games and just sitting there because probably they didn't really know what they were up against. Like, we're talking about 40, 50 years ago. Scouting was not a thing. You can't just go on YouTube and check out different teams. The knowledge of your opponent was really limited, particularly if you were going to go and play like Red Star Belgrade or something. Like, what are we expecting here? Absolutely no idea. Let's sit in in case they've got a, a quick winger. Whereas nowadays, you know so much more about your opponent that you don't necessarily need that to stop teams from sitting in. So if you look back at where the, the, the rule was created and why, we don't need that anymore. Everybody knows all the players, all the teams, all the styles. Yeah. We can have fair 180 minute battles and it can be really entertaining. So my question just to wrap up on, on away goals is which manager do you think hated the idea of removing <laughs> away goals? If you had to pick one manager that instantly saw the news and went, you know what, oh, I'm not a fan of this. Because mine would be Mourinho. Yeah, I think it was he, mine as well. I think you'd thrive. Naturally, you think defensive, don't you? You think, which defensive yeah, coach is really annoyed about this? Simeone? Yeah. I don't know, but also, it, it, yeah. No, Simeone and Mourinho, I think. Harry? Has to be. Yeah, those are the two standout names. I, I don't think Ancelotti would have been thrilled by it either. Um, I know he's not a defensive coach per se, mm. but he is of that older school. Traditionalist. Traditionalist. Yeah. Uh, I think he probably would have been a bit irked by it initially. Probably quite, he's, he'll be grateful now because he's conceded three goals at the Bernabeu and they're still in the tie. So. <laughs> Speaking of Diego Simeone, uh, Harry, Atletico Madrid 2, Dortmund 1. Um, I know you wanted to touch on, I mean, this is, a, this is a weird game actually because Atletico really did dominate for the early parts of this one. But I think Dortmund will be happy knowing the deficit is only one goal going into the second leg. But I know you wanted to talk about Antoine Griezmann. And is there a conversation to be had about whether he is underrated as a footballer? Not only just in Europe, but in world football. Yeah, he's massively underrated for me. And I, I feel like he's one of those players that you talk about him being underrated so much that maybe there comes a point where you're actually overrating him mm. a little bit. Mm. But last night's display from him again was just incredible. The movement, the way he drops into pockets of space, some of the passing, the pass for the second oh. Atletico goal, the way he dinked Stop. it over the defender. Wasn't the easiest ball to control, mind you, but the way he sort of just Stripped spots it. the opportunity and yeah, he, yeah, he kind of like stabs it over the, the defender and finds his man. And then in the build-up um, to, I can't remember if it was the goal or another opportunity that they had, he dropped deep, he got the ball, he looks over his shoulder and he plays a pass with his weaker right foot right round the corner and he sets them off on an attack again. That's just two examples. His passing is incredible, his vision's incredible. The work rate as well is, is there. I just think Antoine Griezmann roaming is as dangerous as anybody in world football right now. Is there a more underrated player? in world football right now because it's a weird one with Antoine because uh, I don't know him on as a sort of mate I don't know why I'm on a first name basis with him All right, uh, Antoine. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the point is I mean you look, look at Greece with someone who was so uh, pivotal when, when France won the World Cup you felt like his stock was at its highest there and he's kind of gone under the radar a little bit, Sam. Is that fair? I just, I think it's a combination of... So basically, everybody agrees that Griezmann is an amazing footballer. But then there are a couple things holding him back. One is the fact that he plays for Atletico Madrid, which is an ever so slightly unfashionable choice, really, even in the grand scheme of things, even though they're a mightily successful club. If he played for Real Madrid or Barcelona, he would be spoken about in different terms. He did play for Barcelona. He did, yeah. And we did speak about him in different <laughs> terms. He was rubbish. <laughs> 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 You're right, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other thing is, I think there's actually a lot of people out there that carry a, quite a personal dislike for him because of his personality, his antics. If he starts making documentaries about himself, calling himself a legend again, I might start disliking him again. These things factor into our judgment of players. And when we talk about the best in the world, we talk about the best in certain positions, subconsciously or consciously, they have an effect on us. Mm. And we don't talk about him in that sense. And it's probably a little bit unfair because everything he's put down for France over the last three, four years or beyond, and for Atletico Madrid in two spells, absolutely sublime. Scott? 
Do you know what? Remember when there was lots of speculation about United signing him back in like 2016? I was so on board with it. And just the, the evolution of him as a player from then to, to this point. It's completely different players. At Euro 2016, he was... I can't remember where he played exactly, but he was... Was he a top scorer? He was a left winger when he... I remember before yeah, as well. Was, yeah. like Back Sassinaz. in the day. It's like a great evolution, you know, of a player and like him being aware of his... Maybe his limitations, but also things he's gaining experience learning how to play in certain matches and learning how to utilize some different skills over the course of his career. Really, really good. I, I think it's just a shame that I I really liked him a good few years ago. I would have loved to see him in the Prem. We mentioned about Atletico being the unfashionable choice. Um, and we mentioned on this show a few times about who the dark horses for the Champions League are. Now, I put the rogue shout out, Sam, that, that Dortmund would be... <laughs> not not to win it. Fuck, let's stay, let's stay on it. But that's what but, it means. That, that, yeah, hang on dark horses to win a well, competition. It depends what your definition of a dark horse is. For me, it's causing maybe an upset here and there. That's not a dark horse. That's not a dark well, horse. Not, well, it wasn't explicitly said that it was dark horse to win it. It was dark. It, it was, was. It was dark, dark horse. No, no, it wasn't Scott. It was dark horse to maybe just, you know, cause an upset here and there. And I think if uh, if Dortmund gets the semi-finals of the Champions League, they're the dark horses for the competition. <laughs> I've really All done myself holy. But the point is, Sam, at Letico Madrid, there is, there is always part of you, with all black and gold, you think of Griezmann, etc., and, and some individuals, Rodrigo de Paul, they could just potentially cause an upset and be the dark horses this season. Do you buy that? Any anyone from that side of the draw is the dark horse. Yes, because it's so stacked one side and so lacking in the other that whoever emerges out of this bare pit of of, of four games to get to the final. I mean, like basically one of these teams is going to be in the final, and they're all worse than at least three of the other teams on the other side. So. By nature, the dark horse is coming from that side. But I guess if I was in your shoes, I would have gone for the winner of PSG against Barcelona to be the dark horse. Because yeah. you would never, when you look at it pre-season, ever pick those two teams to be like, yeah, I reckon they can win it. But then once that draw and that path was made, you're like, one of these guys is going to be in the final. That's one game away. So that's where you go with it. I would never have picked Dortmund. Though. Yeah, that was a rogue shout. I don't really know what I was drinking that day. But um, Harry, your dark horse was... Was it Atletico? I didn't. I, well, I said Atletico could go deep, which they, they could. They have. Yeah, they have. Yeah. I, I didn't call them a dark horse because I don't think they can win. I, uh, well, that was kind of my frame of mind that Dortmund could go deep in the competition. You um, <laughs> should have said that then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Scott, um, PSG Barca. You fell asleep halfway through it. <laughs> uh, I'm give, sorry. Don't, don't give it away. Don't, don't ask him then. <laughs> ask me. I've got the notes. <laughs> Sam, the floor is yours. PSG Barca. <laughs> These are all fake. <laughs> this was amazing. Absolutely um, amazing. Yeah, talk through. It was amazing. Um, the first half was entertaining without being goal-filled. Mm. And after the previous night, where we'd watched, obviously, Arsenal, Bayern and, and, and Man City, Real Madrid, it was like, well, the only thing lacking here is a couple of absolutely cracking goals. And yeah, second half really came to life. Obviously, PSG have lost 3-2. They've hit the woodwork twice in the second half. This was extremely even. And the great thing about it was it seemed to to and fro based on every sort of 15-minute spell. Like, PSG came out of the traps brilliantly. Then Barcelona got a handle of it. Gundogan dropped deeper into midfield because he thought, my team's really struggling here. And he got his foot on the ball. All of a sudden, Barcelona were just playing through PSG easily. Gundogan is absolutely amazing. Lewandowski was great too. Rafinha starts running in behind. It causes them all sorts of problems. Obviously, they won 1-0 up at half-time with, uh, with the Rafinha goal. And then Luis Enrique starts making his substitutions and his changes. He starts bringing on players and they wrestle back control basically immediately. Same thing as we saw against uh, the previous night. A half-time sub makes a massive difference. He brings on Barkala here and, and it makes a difference. Dembele scores. So then Luis Enrique goes, all right then, I'll bring on Pedri. <laughs> Pedri chips the ball over. Goal. Unbelievable. All right then, Luis Enrique says, I'll bring on these guys. And uh, it just keeps going. It keeps, yeah, it's punch and counter punch, punch and counter punch. Amazing to watch and so fun to keep track of. And that then, was goal of the night, wasn't it? The Pedri to Rafinha. Yes. Even the, the, the fact yes. that he kind of sliced across it oh, on the outside of his foot. Gorgeous. I think that, that was on purpose. I think it was. That was on right. purpose. Reckon? Yeah, yeah, I reckon so. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. Brazilian. <laughs> That's a great point. But w one thing I would say about Rafinha with the technique is I, he's almost gone past the ball slightly to get that technique because I mean we've all tried it on a Sunday when the ball's over the top and you're thinking oh god I've missed I wouldn't it. try it anymore <laughs> <laughs> hamstrings <laughs> Rafinha's an interesting one though because I think you know people who don't watch a lot of La Liga and don't watch a lot of Barcelona will always think of his time at Leeds mm -hmm. and whether he could make the step up from Leeds to Barcelona and he's it's, it's an interesting story though really because obviously everybody knows Barcelona's uh, difficulties and he's one of the names that's been floated 
consistently, yeah. almost since like a year after he joined, as one of the players that they could potentially look to cash in on as one of the most sellable assets that they could are actually willing to part with. So for him to perform like he did last night and score the, the goals he scored, you know, really, really important. And one of the best moments for him, I think. But I, I think this tie in general... I thought, I, th- I, thought PSG, I thought PSG would win last night, but okay, I think me too. Yeah. I don't think this is over yet, you know? Because Mbappe, maybe we'll have a conversation about him at some point. We but, will. You know, maybe not his best night. Down the line, is he going to be facing Barcelona twice a season? Maybe more times uh, in, a, in a Real Madrid shirt? Possibly. Uh, but he's been in Camp Nou before and scored goals as well, hasn't he? So mm-hmm. I, I feel like he'll want to make a statement. Harry, this one's finally poised. How do you see the second leg going? Are you still... Back in Barca with that one goal. Yeah, difference. so like the guys, I thought this was PSG's opportunity, really. It's not the best Barca side. There's a lot of uncertainty off the pitch. Xavi leaving. Now we're hearing that the club are trying to get him to stay somehow and, and do a bit of a U-turn on his decision, which is really, really interesting because that doesn't often happen, right? Once that announcement comes out, that means it's happening. If he does that, by the way, Liverpool fans will start going, please? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Jürgen, please? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, I thought that it was a big opportunity for PSG and for me they they didn't take it Rafinha incredible player for me I really wanted Arsenal to sign him not that long ago when he was linked he obviously made his mind up he wanted to go to Barcelona Um, that deal then happened and I think he's gone there and he has made that step up that you talk about he hasn't looked out of place he hasn't looked like it's you know a level too far for him he's looked great all the time he's got a really weird technique of striking the ball but I really like it what, in what you way? Me- like you mentioned the finish for the goal where he sort of takes it on the slice. He's got this ability, I think, Rafinha, to hit low shots with the inside of his boot, but with this incredible venom mm. that you would expect to generate from your laces. And he so- seems to have this technique where he sweeps the ball low and he causes keepers problems. And it bends as well, and doesn't it? Bends, it's low and it yeah. bends. It doesn't make any sense. And he likes to go like ac- back across the goal rather than sort of setting it out with the left foot and thinking you're going to go for the, the sort of that corner. He tries to go the other way. I, I just think he's brilliant. I, I was really happy for Xavi last night as well because I thought some of Luis Enrique's comments in the lead up to this game, and I know he was almost pushed into them by some of the questioning, but to say I represent Barcelona's playing style more than Xavi does and that kind of thing, a guy that you worked with, a guy that you were incredibly successful with, I thought was bordering on disrespectful and I thought you could see when Barca got the third goal by Xavi celebrations, that he loved every single mm-hmm. second of that. Is Luis Enrique wrong though with those comments? Probably not. Probably it's probably factually true. Uh, whether or not you need to say it is another question. I don't know. I mean, look to be fair, uh, saw Luis Enrique and Xavi, you know, sort of see each other in the tunnel pre-match. They didn't look like there was any problems between them. They looked like they were they were still pretty happy to see each other, good friends. So I don't think either of them took it too too harshly, but. It's kind of like nightmare fuel, isn't it, for the for the players? You know, oh look at that, they think you're more Barca the, the, than you guys. <laughs> you know, what, what, what do you say to that, Pedri? Oh, I'll tell you what I think of that, dink, that sort of thing. You never know what kind of effects that might have. Maybe it's maybe it's nothing. Maybe it's something. Um, I'm pleased for Xavi too, because uh, he was he looked very worn down. He was under a lot of pressure. Um, it's very difficult, as you say, at that club right now with the circumstances surrounding it. They just can't seem to have one single normal day at that club without something going wrong. And so to be the person that has to hold the ceiling up and stop it all from caving in, it's very difficult. I mean, it's yeah. a bit like Eric Ten Hag last season, where it's all like everything's kicking off, and Eric Ten Hag is yeah. he's sort of stood there I going. I think United are in the running order today. Are they? <laughs> <laughs> We've managed to squeeze them in at any single point. It's, 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 it's that, it's that Champions break, League, guys. <laughs> Please. Sorry, yeah, it's, it's, it is a Champions League show. I shouldn't have mentioned Manchester United. Um, but it, it's like that. It feels like sometimes it feels like there's just one man halt stopping the roof from collapsing, and that was Xavi. And since he announced that he was going to leave, it's 12 games unbeaten. And they've yeah. been brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. These players are certainly playing for him. We mentioned... Uh, sorry, go on, Harry. I was just going to say, you've got to mention the youngsters as well. Yeah. Mate, they... A 16-year-old and a 17-year-old in the side. Yeah. And, and they were both, I thought, looked mature beyond I know this is a, maybe a bit of a rogue point, but is there something to be said about young players who are playing for major teams now and they just don't look phased at all? Is it just me? I feel there's a new generation of players that, you I mean, Belling was sort of the one that's just absolutely taken off, but Pedri, Javi, et cetera, et cetera. These players who just don't seem phased at all. Is there anything in that, do you think, than usual? Because, or is it just... I think that the way they bring players up in Spain, so I'm talking about Kobasi at centre-back, oh, wasn't, his, 
it wasn't his greatest game, I don't think, yesterday. Really? In terms of what good. I've seen of no, him but before. He, no, but he's, he played, like, against Atletico Madrid, he was outstanding. Mm. Against Hetafe in February, he was outstanding. Like, he has had some... So in terms yeah. of the level he's he has had some, hit. like, what Harry right. said is yeah. he's had some lights out games, perfect games. Last night was not perfect by any stretch, but it was very good. Yeah. And then the other one is obviously Lamine Yamal in attack. And I just think the way that they bring players up in Spain with the B teams and all of that stuff, I just think is so much more effective than the system that we have here. Mm. I think the gap in England between academy football and senior football has never been bigger. Mm. Back in the day when I was growing up, you had the reserves, right? And you, you'd bring these players through there. And if there was a first team player that wasn't at 100%, was coming back from an injury, what would you do? You'd put them in the reserves. They play with the reserves. Those kids got the opportunity to experience something much closer to what they'll need to be up to the level of week in, week out by sort of mixing and integrating with those players. And now it's like you're looking at some of the academy games and you're seeing score lines like 8-5 eight, and 8-6. Eight, that, 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 nine, 9-1. United's, United's under 18 speed Liverpool. That, nine, doesn't, one the that doesn't prepare you. <laughs> You've got to get it in. Absolutely <laughs> shameless. <laughs> <laughs> like, that, that just doesn't prepare you for, for senior football. And I think in Spain, Goodness, mate. They, they've always been better at developing I didn't ask players. We've seen that for a long, long and time. And Germany has too, right? Germany has too, absolutely. And I think... That's why when they come through those clubs and then they make those appearances and they look fine, I think it's because of all the groundwork that's been done before. So what you're talking about there is a pathway, ultimately, mm. setting up the pathway and, and English clubs maybe struggling with that. Although what I will say is that is that obviously Bellingham stepped in to senior football, although he's a bit of a, a freak of nature, but stepped in and did fine. And, and Kobe Mainu hasn't looked particularly phased. Bukayo Saka was very good from the off. Maybe we are getting a bit better with it. But yeah, in, in Spain, certainly, they'd have no issue here. I mean, look, they're being fast-tracked not only into the first teams of Barcelona and Real Madrid, they get fast-tracked into the Spanish national team at 17 nowadays. Yeah. Gavi, Pedri, Cavasi, they all just, oh, he's good enough to play for the national team. Great, let's go. Like, it's getting a bit much, actually. We've touched on a few individuals. Uh, and one player that has, has just kind of taken off as well is Kylian Mbappe. Now, Scott, a lot's been made of his performance last night and maybe failing to make the difference on the big stage. There was a lot made the night before about Erling Haaland failing to make the difference on the big stage against Real Madrid. Is there anything in it? I Come on, people. This is, this is very silly. This is very silly. I saw Kylian Mbappe score a hat-trick in a World Cup final. Like, come on. I know, I know penalties and stuff. But Erling Haaland specifically, yeah, there is a debate there about whether he's ineffective. But no, he's not a League Two player. And I know Sam wants to say a bit. Uh, in, a, <laughs> in a little while. Don't he's, throw he, me to the he's walls. Not a league. Get that camera on him now. I'm saying it now. <laughs> I know you agree with it. He's not a League Two player. He's not a League Two player. He is one of probably the best striker in the world. One of the top two. And Kylian Mbappe is just at that level where, you know, he's going to be one of the greatest players to ever, ever play the game. And you can't like look at him off the back of one match and say, hey man, you can't, you can't do it. I, I just think it's a... We're in a society nowadays and in a media world where every, we have to be so sensationalist about absolutely everything. What would everything. we make clips about yeah. if we don't I know. say that? <laughs> was, yeah. We'd make a, make a clip on whether you can hear the whistle. Yeah, or not, there you go. <laughs> Did Kylian Mbappe hear the whistle last night? That's why he didn't, he didn't turn up. Maybe he never started the game. <laughs> <didn't> <laughs> Did the game even kick off? <laughs> it's a, it's, people have to go to extremes. Uh, I just think it's a little bit silly. He will be back. He'll be playing for Real Madrid next season and he will be scoring lots of goals against Barcelona. The Sam, the floor is yours. On Mbappe or Haaland? Or? Both. Look, Mbappe was okay last night. He wasn't bad. He was okay. He just didn't make the difference. And obviously, we, we look at him through a certain lens now because he's officially qualified for the conversation of world's best player. I know based on the fact that Ronaldo and Messi are where they are age-wise, that debate feels relatively open. Um, and Mbappe is in that debate. So when you talk about a player in that sense, you are expecting on a night like this at home to be making the difference, and he basically did not. It wasn't bad, he just wasn't great. And there were other players around him that were better, like Vitinha was better, Ruiz was better. Nuno Mendes, the left-back, powering up behind him, he actually had more of an impact, really, mm. than Kylian Mbappe. Mm. So you're just judging these players by greater standards, and that's probably why you end up with certain people talking about Erling Haaland as, as League Two players, uh, as silly as that might be. And Raphael van der Vaart, who's very outspoken, yeah. um, recently said that if he doesn't score, he doesn't do anything, which is also wrong. You know, that's just wrong, isn't it? I mean, it, a forward can occupy centre-backs. He can occupy more than one player. He can run in behind and create space and pockets for attacking midfielders to use. There's so much more to it than goals. And I appreciate that Erling Haaland scoring 40-odd a season sometimes hides the fact that it's about more than scoring goals. But 
it's very rare for him to actually play like like to have an anonymous game of football. Yeah, Jakey, um, we have just come through a, a generation of watching Messi and Ronaldo lift football performance and goal scoring to levels which we have never ever seen before. Uh, I think, especially if you started watching football from about two thousand seven, two thousand eight, when those two players were literally on top of the world for two thousand and five, like that. you, two thousand and four, like you. Do you know what? I think my first game was two thousand four. Really? Oh, yeah. that's depressing. Mate, People was, like me. I was 14. Wait, you look <laughs> great for your age, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, but my point is that Messi and Ronaldo were so good. And that generation we just lived through of football, with them being at Real Madrid and Barcelona, going punch for punch, goal for goal, and scoring the numbers of goals, the volume of goals in Champions League, at international level, yeah. at club level in general. The fact that they scored so many goals makes people think that that is normal. That is not normal. We've just gone through a generation where... They have raised the bar so much higher in terms of statistics that now the players in this generation have to like get close to matching those standards. Otherwise, you know, they will they're judged as failures in some cases. So basically, what we're saying is the scrutiny on Mbappe and Haaland is Messi and Ronaldo's fault. No, I'm not saying this, that, but <laughs> but the, the sort of like that's a good clip. <laughs> yeah, clip that up. <laughs> uh, um, are we basically saying that the scrutiny on those two guys? Because the thing is, right. There's certain players which maybe aren't in that elite bracket will get away with a few bad performances here and there. I feel like the scrutiny we put on Mbappe and Haaland because of the levels they can show mm -hmm. has increased to a level that we can't I, I, really I think Sam's analyze. point earlier about likability is important here as right, well. Okay. I think with Kylian Mbappe, I don't have an issue with him. I quite like him. But I think a lot of the stuff he's said and done because he's quite been quite outspoken about his future and there's been you know, standoffs with PSG about contracts and then U-turns and all of that. I think all of that impacts people's opinion of him. Erling Haaland, look, I'm not a Manchester City fan. I'm sure they love him, but I don't see him as the warmest of characters. Like, I don't think... From he was a, never that anyway. No, he never was. But what I'm saying is I think that impacts people's perception. And then when you have a bad game or a game where you're not quite at the levels that you know that everybody has seen you get to before you can become a little bit like, well, he's not that good anyway. And, and there's no, there's nobody jumping up to defend Erling Haaland, apart from Man City fans. Whereas with Messi, it was always like, I don't care if he's had an off game tonight. This is Lionel Messi. Well, he had his own army, didn't yeah, he? Exactly. Yeah. And, it's why, <laughs> and it's why Lionel Messi now, look at the coverage around Messi, who's also gone to a uncompetitive league and is coasting it now. Look at that in comparison to Cristiano Ronaldo. Because one of them is a much more likable character and the other one's a little bit standoffish at times. Are you telling me that Ronaldo is trying to stat pad in Saudi Arabia? Well, Ronaldo got sent off for violent conduct the other day and put his fist up at the referee, didn't he? Yep. Yeah. So, so not fantastic. It's not very likable, is he? I'm, <laughs> I'm debating whether I, I don't think I've ever said this on video before. Wow. Oh. Um, get camera. Oh. I'm, de I'm debating whether I actually want to say this. But you know, everyone loves Ronaldinho, right? And everybody loves Zidane. Zidane is one of my top three favourite players. He's about to time. call one of these two players overrated. No, I'm about to say that if they played in this generation, people would call them, uh, they w would say things about them that are yeah. not so popular. Yeah, and yeah. they would call out their statistics and they would call out their lack of goals. Is it, and their Zidane, lack of Zidane's lack of games. goals particularly would be absolute cannon fodder for, yes. for football Twitter, for sure. Um, <laughs> it would be, yeah, it would be, it would be horrendous. Um, <laughs> when you look back at players, you remember the good bits and you suppress the bad bits. When you watch players in real time, you see all of it. It's, it's the old rose tinted glasses thing. So, yeah, I'm absolutely certain that if uh, Ronaldinho was playing today and he had a bit of a stinker, then a few people would be having a, having words about it. But, you know, you just watch the the highlight reel of all the elasticos and damn, he looks good. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Halfway through the show, uh, please do leave a like on the stream, subscribe to 90 Min, and let us know if uh, Zidane and Ronaldinho are overrated in the comment section below. Um, That's not what I said. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I said. I know, I know. Uh, moving on to tonight, Sam, we need to talk about Aston Villa mm. in the Conference League. Uh, and we will have a video coming up solely dedicated to Aston Villa. Harry's going to be hosting it as an Emery enthusiast with <laughs> Sam and, uh, and Conton, who's coming from the Knights of the French team. Um, Sam, where does the Conference League rank in Villa's priorities to the end of the season? Yeah, you'll, Above get, the Premier League? you'll get a different answer from every fan. Uh, the question you should be asking is, where does it rank in Unai Emery's priorities? There we go. <laughs> Yeah, and that's also a difficult question to answer. Uh, I think he might change his mind on that one every single day. It's very difficult for Villa at the moment with the, the lack of players. I know everyone talks about injuries, but Villa really, just the same as everybody, like really badly afflicted. And uh, every time they lose one, they lose one for the whole year. It's not like, ah, oh, I lost him for three weeks. It's like, oh, ACL, bye. 
I'd like three or four of those, you know, it's very difficult. Um, they're running on fumes here. Like, we look at the, the Premier League run in and look at Villa versus Spurs and, and, and Villa are sort of, you know, 10, 11 games ahead of Spurs in terms of games played. It's having an effect. The lack of squad depth is having an effect. There's nothing they can really do about it. It's tiring stuff. You know, 40 plus games at this stage of the season, Sunday, Thursday, Sunday, Thursday, Sunday, relentless trips to the Etihad, trips to the Emirates. You know, th these are difficult. It's difficult to balance all of this. And um, it kind of depends on who you've got available. So if you go back to the City game, Ollie Watkins was injured for it. If Ollie Watkins was fit, I think Villa would have given that a bit a, a better go. But I think they just thought, right, OK, Wolves on Saturday, Derby. Etihad Wednesday, Ollie Watkins is injured. And then we've got to beat Brentford on Saturday. Six points from nine would be fine. Yeah, let's just send the B team up to Manchester. And that's what they did. It was Villa B at the Etihad. Harry was very annoyed. Aha. Uh -huh. So when I sat here the other day and I said, <laughs> right, and I said on this, what on have this I show. Done? Sorry, what have I, I done? Don't I, I don't know what he's going to say. I said on this show that <laughs> I didn't think that Villa gave it their all. They did not. And I said that, I, you know, it, it felt strange to me that some players all of a sudden weren't available, etc., etc. I got hammered in the comments for saying that. Okay. Oh, how could you suggest something so ridiculous? Aston Villa fan, Sam Tai, has confirmed <laughs> that there are Villa fans out there that Here we believe go. <laughs> in my theory about that game. Just saying. I think you're probably right. I think with Watkins injured, they're like, what are the chances of a win here? With Watkins in the team, the chances are at most 20%. Mm. With no Watkins, you're like, okay, it's dipping below 20. Got to look at the amount of games we've got to play here and reshift those priorities. And I do wonder, not to look too far ahead, but I do wonder if that same thing is going to happen on Sunday against Arsenal because, because Douglas Luiz is suspended <laughs> and Villa presumably put in quite a lot of effort tonight it's the home game against Lille it's a tournament that obviously what they want to win it's a big it's a big occasion for Villa this there's a lot of excitement around it just like there was with the Ajax game I mean I went to that one and the, the atmosphere was tremendous like the, the excitement of welcoming such a big name and I appreciate they've descended into outright chaos but mm. Ajax is such a big name and welcoming that team to Villa Park after 13 years out of European football. It was a massive, massive deal. And there's emotional energy attached to this as well as physical energy. And Villa are about to do it again tonight against Lille. And what have they got left in the tank for Arsenal, you know, with, with no Douglas Luiz? I don't know. And will, you, will, they, will Unai Emery again decide to try and pick his battles a little bit? It's a dangerous game because you can get it so badly wrong, it could backfire on every front. You can get it right and actually achieve all of your goals. It's just hard. Speaking of Arsenal-Villa, Harry, what would be the best outcome from the Villa game tonight for an Arsenal fan? Just a real hard slog. Um, I don't think the result really matters, to be honest. It's a completely different competition. One thing I will give Unai Emery is he has had Mikel Arteta's number quite a bit has since it? Arteta took on the Arsenal job. Uh, we went to Villa Park, obviously, earlier in the season. We're beaten 1-0. Although I don't think that day it was a tactical thing. I just thought that Arsenal, you know, didn't make the most of some of their opportunities should and, and I'm not talking about shots on goal I'm talking about the final pass wasn't there and they you know Villa played that high line that I always talk about that day and I was looking at Arsenal I was like why on earth aren't you cutting through this it just wasn't clicking that day um, but Emery has dumped Arteta out of the Europa League when he was Villarreal boss you know he's 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 had his number at points so I think for Arsenal you know they need to recover too from a really big emotionally draining game I know they've got a couple of extra days and that might be the difference here. But I think Arteta's going to have to tweak the team a little bit as well. So it's a really difficult one to predict, I think. As we mentioned, we will we will touch on Villa in a, in a separate video. But Sam, maybe just to give a sort of quick overview of the season so far from a Villa point of view. Because we do get a lot of uh, stick because we, we haven't had a lot of... Well, we haven't had any Villa representation on this show. And even when we do touch on Villa, it's normally a, a, an Uno Emery loving. So... Uh, Sam, do you want to... Is that sarcastic? <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you want to maybe just, for, for people who, who are tuning in and would be yeah. really keen to hear the sort of perspective on Villa's season so far? I mean, Villa fans are immensely proud of the season. You know, however it goes, immensely proud. We've gone very, very deep into the European competition. Uh, appreciate the Premier League team should always be favourites to win the Conference League, but you still have to, you still have to get through it. Played well. Learned a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of learning on the job. A lot of inexperience. Probably the same thing we talk about with Arsenal squad and how they're very inexperienced at the Champions League level. A lot of this Villa team have never played like European football. They've never gone to Legia Warsaw and experienced an atmosphere like that. I know I was shocked by it. You know, Morgan, <laughs> Morgan, Morgan, Morgan Rogers stepping up from, from Middlesbrough and stepping it. Like so many new things are happening here, and against 
a backdrop of really bad injury luck with ACL tears, Camera and Mings and Buendia and losing players, Jacob Ramsey and his cursed metatarsal. That's not a Harry Potter book. It's, uh, it's actually, uh, <laughs> it's, honestly, it's, it's, been, it's been a real slog at times, but the amount of good performances, the amount of great results, and yes, it's starting to waver a little bit, but that's okay. That's okay for it to waver a little bit. Villa fans are immensely proud of, of, what, of what the team have managed to do so far this season. Nice. It should be. Mm. Yeah, it's been should a really be good season. Um, we, we touch on Arsenal Villa, the other game of the, the weekend that we will just touch on briefly uh, Scottish Newcastle versus Spurs. Um, <laughs> I was going to ask Sam actually oh, we, about. We got questions. Yeah. Lovely. Prediction. Well, we, don't know the, we don't know the score yet. We, we were going we to ask about. The, <laughs> we were gonna I was ask, just wondering maybe maybe we'd have just badges and not question marks. We were going to ask about the importance of the Spurs defeat, uh, Spurs win rather at Villa Park against Villa, and Spurs have a particularly bad record at St James's Park as well. Was it last season that they lost? They had a bad final day a couple of years back under Poch. There was another one. Yeah, there's, there's been quite a few bad trips up to St James's Park for Tottenham fans. Um, I think it was like a four 0 inside of twenty minutes, wasn't it? Yes, last yeah, last yeah. season. Yeah. Um, Villa... Hang on, hang on. That was the one where the the Stellini played fullbacks, Porro and uh, yes. yeah, that was car crash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we mentioned sort of Villa kept leaving the door open for Spurs, but also it, with the fifth position, the coefficient points, the way for points, it does look like fifth is going to be up for the champion. Uh, up for well, the, no, have a look at the, have a look at maybe. The, maybe. And if you look at the points, Italy are currently in first on seventeen point seven, England sixteen point five, and then Germany on sixteen point five in terms of which position would would it go to? So, so what we're saying there is top four, top well, top five is not necessarily as much of a guarantee. If you ask Opta. And their super duper computer. Oh, we mentioned that last quite a few you times. Love super last, I love a super computer. Yeah. yeah, they will say there's a 75 percent chance that this spot goes to England. But if Leverkusen beat West Ham and Bayern Munich beat Arsenal, those percentages change pretty dramatically. So, look, Villa are still in the competition themselves, so they can have a say. Um, you still got Liverpool in the Europa League, and obviously Manchester City are also there. Bayern might have to go through Arsenal and Manchester City, which seems unlikely for it to swing into Germany's favour. But it is it is an open question, Mark. So, so what you're saying is that if Arsenal go out of the Champions League, you could the, cost the consolation could be that we cost Tottenham Champions League football next year. Or Unai Emery, pick whichever yeah, one. Whoever I mean, finishes fifth. I'd prefer to, to cost Tottenham, okay. for sure. Yeah. Um, it's possible, yeah. yeah. It's very possible. Newcastle Spurs, Scott. <coughs> How do we see Do, do we feel like this Newcastle are getting a bit of a... They've had a, a similar to Villa. They've had a, a horrible, horrible bit of luck with injuries. We do have to mention that with Eddie Howe. I do think that narrative around Eddie Howe is interesting, though. I do feel like he gets a free pass quite a lot. He does because some of the defending this season I've seen from Newcastle has been absolutely woeful. Is that fair, Sam? Is the narrative around Howe because he's a little bit of the media's darling? I think people personally. like him. Yeah, yeah, people like him. They warm to him. He speaks well as mm. well. Um, so he's just very personable, and may, maybe he gets. He gets off with a few things here and there. I, I, I don't want to pile in too heavily because it has been it has been a very difficult campaign for him in terms of managing those injuries. And they've had some, like, again, we have, we do tend to have short memories, don't we? Had some cracking performances, especially in the chat. I know they ended up going out of Europe, but like the, the win against PSG was absolutely awesome. And that was them at their very best. Um, although it's hard to defend some of the performances they put together in the last couple of months. Gaps between the lines. This team are on the, like Villa, like they're flagging energy-wise, and he's still going press, press, and the front five are pressing, and the the back four are dropping off because Dan Burns scared of the space behind him, and there's a big gap in the middle again. Oh, who's going to plug that? Nope, no one can do it. They've conceded again. Like it's only there's only so many times this can happen before you start to really genuinely ask questions. And looking at like the expected goals against in a in every Newcastle game, it's almost always more than one, one point two, one point four. They're leaky. They're leaky, but then, like, you know, they lost the goalkeeper, they lost two centre halves, they lost the right back. It's difficult. And also, when you look at the option that Newcastle have at the back, do you, do you think we maybe overestimated the quality of their defensive unit? Because, like, no They're disrespect a to Jamal. success, Jakey. Yeah. Like, last season, nobody expected them to qualify for the Champions League, really. It was only because of the underperformance of Liverpool, Chelsea, although mm. you could argue. Chelsea's performance is on their level <laughs> currently. Uh, Newcastle were not expected to get in that, get into the Champions League last season. I think it was, if anything, it's worked against Eddie Howe in the fact that last season being so good and Newcastle maybe regressing to norm this season has worked against him because obviously, they, I think, I said it yeah. at the time, they've jumped a year too early, probably. Um, but I, I, think, I think they'll finish the season strongly. Hopefully they can 
from a Newcastle perspective, they can get some of their injuries back. And I think I think they'll give Tottenham a really good game. I think they might beat Spurs this weekend. That That's fair. All the stuff you've said about them being victims of their own success is absolutely fair. But just to put into kind of context how they are viewed through a totally different lens. And I know Chelsea has spent a lot of money and we, we have that all the time. If Chelsea win their game in hand that they have over Newcastle, they go level on points with them. So uh, Chelsea, Tottenham. Chelsea have lost less games this season than Newcastle have. And so the point I'm trying to make is that like the, the narrative around Newcastle is always, well, Eddie Howe's had loads of injuries and mm-hmm. it's okay. And, you know, they, they're, they're leveling out and it's fine. And I'm not saying that's not true, but I just think it's interesting how everybody wants to pile in on Chelsea all the time, myself included, yeah. um, <laughs> and say, oh my God, what a disaster and a car crash this is. But when it comes to Newcastle, who were a Champions League side this season, we all go, oh yeah, but it's okay because they've had some injuries and they've leveled that. I'm not saying there's no validity to that mm. point. I just think it's really interesting the way that we I also, I also am very reluctant sometimes to just pass off all the injuries at Newcastle as bad luck. Because I, oh yeah, absolutely. so so yeah. so for, for, so to draw the parallel to Villa, um, that many ACL tears is bad luck, right? ACL tear is bad luck. Full stop. You can't wear and wear down an ACL. That doesn't exist. It's a twist. It's an unfortunate landing. It's whatever. A lot of these Newcastle injuries, like some of them have been bad. Some of them ACLs. Some of them are just like he's done his hamstring four minutes after coming on as a sub. Why didn't he warm up properly? He's done his groin again. You know, is Eddie Howe asking too much of this team? in terms of that pressing and that energy. And here's the fatal flaw for Newcastle, is that the way they control games of football is through intensity and it's through energy. Yeah. They can't control a game of football through possession, through territory like that. So if they're not at it 100%, and if they're not showing their best energy, they can't actually play anywhere near their full potential and they definitely can't control proceedings on the pitch. So they've only got one mode and it's go, go, go. And I think the inability to draw back from that a little bit and control a game in a different way has cost them in the injury room and therefore ended up costing them in points. It's going to be fascinating mm. how it develops at Newcastle as well, especially with the, uh, with the England job becoming available very, very soon, whether Eddie Howe will be in that, that mix potentially. Maybe. Maybe. Also, just like they're the richest club in the world and they expect the absolute best and they've been floating in mid-table most of the season. We all like Eddie Howe, but the owners probably won't be feeling that same yeah. level of affection. They'll be looking at it and going, well, that's not good enough. Speaking about narratives around owners and managers, uh, obviously West Ham are in action against Leverkusen in the Europa League. Um, I speak to Toby in the, in the office, big West Ham fan, and he said to me, it's a weird one with, with West Ham fans and boys because actually if you look at sort of the, the ticket prices to go to see West Ham these days, you can kind of understand what they want to justify better football being played and better football being played at home. And I think there was he was telling me about some of the some of the price that were going around. It was pretty, pretty, yeah, pretty bad. But the point is, um, we talked about we talked about West Ham and Leverkusen, and you said Scott that you think Moyes could get one over Mr. Xabi I, Alonso. I just, I just is think that what you want to say? Down I the just think it's like the magic of football that. A manager like David Moyes, who is so consistently panned for how awful his football is, yet in the face of success that West Ham haven't tasted in generations, um, I just think it would be really magical if he could <laughs> somehow there find be, his way past the darling manager in world magical football. magical about it. <laughs> it yeah. would be yeah. awful. Just, just, just picture this, right? The two, ma- the two teams come out of the tunnels. Right, by Leverkusen, flying high at the top of the Bundesliga. West Ham are having an okay season, but they're getting a, a rough ride. Xabi Alonso comes out in his fashionable gear. Yeah. You know, he's got an Armani top on or something like that. And David Moyes comes out in that grey West Ham tracksuit <laughs> yeah, with his hair messed up. That is so accurate. <laughs> yeah. and, and they just rough up by Leverkusen and they end up getting... It would be magic. Do you it actually think they'll, they'll... I, I, I don't over. think they will. Like, I wouldn't predict it. I wouldn't if if you ask me to predict how that game's going to go. I'm not going to say West Ham are going to get through, but it's not beyond the realms of possibility. And I wouldn't put somebody off if that was their opinion because I think it is <laughs> it, it is possible. I, I just think the Premier League and the resources that the Premier League clubs have is so far superior to what you see in Europe that I would just never rule out a Premier League team unless you're talking about a select group of three or four on the continent. And, and West Ham are a decent Premier League team and I think they could cause... But isn't it so problems. difficult to try and judge all of this? Because you, you immediately try and go, well, how are they doing in the league? Well, almost perfect. Great. But we did this with Bayern. You know, Arsenal mm-hmm. just absolutely slashed Brighton 3-0. Brilliant performance. 
Bayern Munich, meanwhile, losing to Heidenheim. So you'd think, okay, well, based on that, Arsenal were gonna Arsenal were gonna beat Bayern pretty handsomely. It was their most challenging game in months. Yeah, easy. Like six months or something like that. So you can't even use the league form, really. It is a step into the unknown every single time. So I'm pretty confident that Bayer Leverkusen are going to win this over two legs. Yet I'm also not confident at all. <laughs> like, well, you're pretty, you're pretty confident Bayer Leverkusen will beat West Ham over two legs. But also a lot of people are pretty confident that Bayer Leverkusen will be in Dublin against Liverpool, Scott. And Liverpool are in action as well against Atalanta. And Grizz has made a lot of points on this show about Atalanta being a pretty pretty good team. Harry's not having it as someone who watches a lot of Syria. Um <laughs> It's not. It's not that I'm not having that they're a decent team. I'm not having that they're going to dump Liverpool out. No, okay. The point. I mean, yeah. There's you, no jeopardy. Do we? Pre- are we predicting a Leverkusen and Liverpool? I mean, we will touch a lot on the Europa League near the do, time. Do you know what? That I, run in for the two teams. Luke Mags uh, in the comments says Chabi Alonso's coaching course didn't prepare him for Suchek bullet headers. <laughs> this is the. This, this is the kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the kind. Like West Ham can go and spoil a game if if they lose two one tonight and take it back. You know, yeah, I, I think sure. yeah, yeah, I think yeah. that's I think that's really difficult. The, the only problems they've got is uh, the injuries and the absentees they've got. Jared Bowen, I think Alvarez is out as well. So, you know, that's a blow for them. Uh, but on Liverpool, Liverpool will qualify easily from this tie. They they really will. Anything we need to know about Atalanta, Harry? Not really. Um, just that they're not. <laughs> Thanks for watching, Ivan. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're just they're not the side that caught everybody by surprise a few years ago under Gasparini. And that it? side lost five nil at home to Liverpool. There you go. They're not that side. They're not as dynamic. They're not as exciting. Um, you know, you, you know what you're going to get from an Italian side in terms of the, the approach and the mindset. But I just I, I just can't see them laying a glove on Liverpool. I really can't. It, depends it, how, is, it just depends how serious Liverpool take it. Yeah. I guess is the is the is the X factor there. But I, I agree. Like it's it's tough to see it. The perfect way out for Jurgen Klopp now is a final in Dublin, isn't it? I think that that's the perfect way uh, for him to leave. And I think they I think they'll qualify from this. So just a, another word: Mo Salah's seventy fifth European game for Liverpool tonight. Um, good record in Europe. Strong player. Although, you know, could this be his last season? In European football, Find out next try, week trying to Liverpool. hide your smile. <laughs> <laughs> I've had enough. <laughs> we mentioned pretty much every single uh, domestic competition: Champions League, Conference League, Europa League. We need to get back to the Premier League as well. So today's ninety-minute football show is brought to you by Skybet. For the fans, bringing you closer to the game that we all love. Skybet's commitment shines through their long-standing sponsorship of the EFL, showing they're not just about bets; they're about enhancing the fan experience, making our love for the game even. Richer. Remember, this is for 18 over. I know I just about look over 18. <laughs> I'm 22, don't worry. So let's enjoy the game responsibly and head over to begambleaware.org for more information. And this brings on to our sort of Skybet debate today, Sam. So a recent YouGov poll asked fans to vote on who they thought would win the Premier League this season. Now, we've given our predictions, but this is mainly more for you. Out of the current top three, Arsenal, Manchester City and Liverpool, and looking at the results from that poll, we can see that Liverpool were the favourites, leading with 48 percent of the votes followed by Manchester City with 31 percent and Arsenal with 15 percent so what do you make of those results just re- remind me of the Arsenal percentage the Arsenal percentage was 15 percent Manchester City 31 percent and Liverpool 48 I thought if you so, would yeah. like context on the table Arsenal are currently top with 71 Liverpool second with 71 Arsenal's goal difference is nine better than Liverpool's and City are third a point behind with 70 points yeah 15 for Arsenal is very low they are my pick to win the league. Um, so I, I, I Harry's like going to try and deflect again. that. That's fine. You know, I'm not, I'm not. I have no problem with other people saying it. Yeah. I just don't want to say it. Right? That is the rule of football. Yeah, exactly. That's completely fine. Um, so if Villa were in the top race, you'd be like, no, it's never happening. Everyone keeps saying we're going to win the conference league. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure we went out in the group stage. <laughs> well, this is the thing. I'm, I'm, I'm no, by no means comparing Arsenal to Leicester. But at what point when Leicester in that 15-16 did we genuinely believe they would go on to win the league. Because I think... Game 35. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, it's not happening. It's not happening. Yeah. It's not happening. It's not happening the whole way through. Yeah, it takes you a while to get around to it, doesn't it? I would, I would, I would understand every Arsenal fan saying, no, 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 don't jinx it, don't say it, don't say it. Did but we just compare Arsenal winning the league to Leicester? That's not what I said. And we're Is taking it away out of context. All I was saying was... You play it down. You play it down for a long, long yeah, time. You've got to. And we've less the. And I remember every single week, people are like they're going to drop off at some point. They're going to drop. Off. It's a completely different situation this season. But my point is, as fans, I think until it's getting tantalisingly close, do we actually genuinely believe it's going to happen? We we do. Before we get onto that, though, we do need a new social media account called Out of Context, Jakey. Like we need this. <laughs> <laughs> we need to pump out clips all day because there's enough of them. There is. Yeah. Yeah. There is. Um, <laughs> look, I've got Arsenal to win the title. I picked them in January. 
And I'm one of those people that picks something and then goes, well, I'm not changing it. Yeah. And to be fair, what evidence is there for me to change this? They're top of the league and they've been basically flawless in the league the entire way through this calendar year. They've won six nil more than once. I mean, what, what more can you give someone? So I'm sticking with Arsenal. And I'm, I'm, I've been continually surprised from January through to now at the, at the lack of faith from other people in Arsenal. You know, the Opta computer always says, oh, it's City, City, City. Even when they're off the pace, lower goal difference, games in hand, City. 40, 50%, whatever. A lot of people are really attracted to that Jurgen Klopp swan song, the final thing, which is, I know it's really romantic. I think Arsenal are a better team. There's obviously one point separating the three sides at the moment. So it is going to be decided on the finest of margins. I think the fact that Arsenal, in my opinion, have the worst set of fixtures by quite some distance in comparison to the other two. I can understand why Arsenal are not the favourites in this poll, but for it to be as low as that is is a bit disrespectful I think to the fact that this side have won 10 out of their 11 games in 2024 where was this poll conducted the North West of yeah. <laughs> in Liverpool did, uh, did we have a conversation the other day that put Arsenal around 20% or was that Liverpool around 20 I think that was Chris doing his mental doing of the his show um, <laughs> Scott I, I've got to ask you sort of about the percentages because I think Liverpool's is probably slightly too high I personally had Arsenal down before the start of the season just to, just to put it out there but I, I think most people would put well clearly not but I thought most people would put City as the favourites and I think you were going to put City is the favourites, right? City are my favourites. I think I still think that they'll win it because of because they've been there, done it several times before, and I feel like they are the one team. Like like you said the other day, Harry, ha- Arsenal have to win seventeen out of eighteen yeah. to actually win the league, which is just incredible. If they do that, then fair play to them; they deserve it. But looking at it now with seven games left in the run-ins, I feel like City have the best previous to show that they could do it this time around as well i get that because it is so often a see it to believe it thing isn't it with this stuff if you've seen it once you can be coaxed into the idea that it will happen again and how many times have we seen city do this yeah. remember that time they won like 13 in a row and just won the title it's like it's 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 so easy to believe that because it's already happened yeah. whereas with arsenal it has not so you are taking a bit more of a leap i am taking that i, leap. I think the worry the worry with arsenal as well is is what impact is the champions league stuff going to have because they've already they could be out next week. They could yeah, be, but th- this is the point. They've already got the the worst run in. Then if they go another round in the Champions League, they're going to play Manchester City, and they're playing somebody who they're directly in competition with. And if you win that, it could be a massive boost. But if you lose that mm. psychologically, it could be huge. So well, it's, we have got a live poll in the in the super chat as well. Which, uh, sorry, in the live chat, who will win the Premier League this season? Liverpool, Arsenal, Manchester City. I mean, the best result surely in the Champions League would be for Arsenal to get through against Bayern and Manchester City to beat Real. For Liverpool fans and for, for Liverpool, Liverpool fans, in general, yeah, yeah. I, I want Arsenal to get through and get Real Madrid. That that's what I want because. You might go and lose to Real Madrid, but that's not the team that you're one of the teams you're competing for with the title. So the the ability to sort of compartmentalize that, mm. put it to one side, and refocus on the league, I think it's it's an easier thing to do than if you you lose to Man City and then they're winning all their league games and they're closing the gap on you and then they overcome you. Oh, it's just I can't. It's too emotional. I can't <laughs> Can you see do something it, funny in the uh, Sorry, it's just Harry there speaking like someone who watched the title charge crumble last season. There, I mean that was. <laughs> I saw all the pain yeah, and all it flashing through as you spoke. Yeah, it was, the end of last season was really tough, man. I, I was in a dark place mm. for the whole summer, most of the summer. Because this is the thing with running a daily Arsenal podcast. It's just reminder. You can't get reminder. away from yeah, it. You yeah, you can't. You can't just go. Ah, never mind. Yeah, and and it didn't you know, happen. Yeah. the other thing was that it, during the time when Arteta was struggling and, and he was trying to build this team and it wasn't going very well and you'd win a couple of games and you think Arsenal would turn a corner and then they'd revert back to type or whatever. There were so many people that were like, get him out, get him gone, he's not good enough. And the problem is, is that every time Arsenal drop any points, that noise comes again from those select few that refuse to accept that he's done a good job now. Yeah. And it's like, it's so draining that you almost want Arsenal to win games half because you want them to achieve what you want them to achieve and half because you don't want to listen to those people Mm. it's difficult we mentioned that YouGov poll so they they had it down as uh, 48% for Liverpool to win the league 31% for Manchester City and Arsenal with 15% if we then look into the live chat and this is just people and we don't know how many Liverpool Arsenal fans and Manchester City fans are in there but currently we've had 100 votes Liverpool 25% Manchester City at 33% and Arsenal at 42% 
what a salesman I am. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think they're just trying to pr- pile the pressure on Harry. To be fair. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be fascinating to see how this one develops. Once again, a big thanks to Skybet um, for the fans bringing you close to the game that we all love. Skybet's commitment shines through their long-standing sponsorship of the EFL, as I mentioned. So they're not just about bets, they're about enhancing the fan experience, making our love for the game even richer. Remember, this is for 18s and over, so let's enjoy the game responsibly and head over to BeGambleAware.org. Now, Sam, we got your predictions uh, for the Premier League, so you're still back in Arsenal? Still back in Arsenal. To wrap up today, yeah. down camera two, we want your predictions wow. for the rest of the season. And we're going to clip it up and we're going to get it out That's really there. mean. That is quite mean. I, okay, sorry. Are you sure about that? <laughs> no, but the, 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 best, <laughs> the, the best part about it, Sam, is that they only ever post them when you get them wrong. Yes. So, yeah, just no, be that. <laughs> okay, predictions for the league, predictions for top four, and predictions for relegation. Okay, so yeah, I've got Arsenal winning the league. Come the top, on, you guys. The top four is clearly... Uh, Arsenal, and then it feels like an absolute toss-up between Liverpool and City. I'll go for Liverpool, then City. Spurs in fourth. Uh, the games that they haven't played, giving them the edge over Aston Villa, who were just flagging a little bit, who will end up finishing fifth. See, I'm doing what <laughs> Harry does. Big. Love it. Uh, one last prediction. This is just to sort of wrap up today's show, because I oh, love it. What's one thing that you'll think will happen before the end of the Premier League season? It can be anything. It can be random. It can be... Teams, players, clubs, fans, Scott losing his mind on a stream. It could be anything. Hmm. Jakey. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't talk about this. Yeah. One, exactly. <laughs> we could have prepped something. One thing that will happen before the end of the season. Uh, Gr- Grizz Khan will tell us that he, he knew all along that Ruben Amarim was the man heading for Liverpool. And we will do a lot of content around Ruben Amarim because it looks like it, it's almost there. Scott, have you... Uh... I think Arsenal will have a big, big... They'll go to Old Trafford or to Tottenham and lose and the title will slip away from them. I think that's what I'm going to call will happen. Sam? Um, I think Bournemouth are going to finish in the top half. <gasps> Love it. Just gone under the radar, isn't he? Right They're really enough. good. Like, well, sometimes. But, uh, <laughs> but that's, that's good enough for ninth. <laughs> you don't need to be really good all the time to finish ninth. Um, yeah, I'll go, for, I'll go for Bournemouth to finish in the top half and... I think, by proxy, Brighton are going to slip out of the top half, which feels really bold. But they've got Villa on the last day, and Villa always beat Brighton. Don't clip that. Um, <laughs> but like, it's one of those games that like Emery seems to seems to have Brighton's number, or Villa seems to be a very good tactical matchup for Brighton's style. And I think that actually Brighton might lose to Villa on the last day, and Brighton might tumble out of the top ten, which. If you think back to pre-season, would you have ever suggested that was going to happen? Even with the European run clouding the schedule, Brighton falling out the top half feels unbelievable, doesn't it? it, is, it that but, shows you how far they've come, though, as a club. Yeah. Because mm. just Brighton staying in the Premier League three years ago was like, good achievement. Good job, guys. Move on. And now it's like, oh, my God, they might not be in the top half. It's crazy. Yeah. Are you more of an Eriola man or a Gary O'Neill man? Eriola, for sure. Yeah. I think I'm more oh, Gary O'Neill. For sure. Yeah. I've got to love it with this. great. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's where we're going to leave it. Sam, what a pleasure. Thanks so much, mate. Uh, Scott Saunders, Harry Simeon. Where's my handshake? Jake Cotton. <laughs> Go on. Do it Sam outside. In, in how many years have you ever had a handshake from him on camera? It's unbelievable. It's not make people feel relaxed. Um, I think that's we're going to leave it. Thanks so much for watching. Please do leave a like on the way out. Subscribe tonight. I mean, follow Sam. He does some fantastic stuff. Scott, Harry, I don't know if I'll do any fantastic stuff, but make sure to subscribe tonight. I mean, we'll see you in the next one. Cheers, guys. <laughs>